Welcome everyone. We're so pleased to have you join us here for the fifth session of Gallagher Talks. This session topic is real estate in the wake of COVID. Our speakers will be having a candid discussion about the market impacts occurring now, why they've been occurring, and what they're gonna do to be both offensive and defensive in this market. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers this morning, Tracy Medeiros, our SVP of National Operations in Canada, along with Jeff Charles, one of our managing directors here in Canada, focused on the real estate industry. If you would like more information on Tracy or Jeff, feel free to click on the right side of the screen and connect with them through LinkedIn. A couple items before we get started. You'll be receiving a recording of this webinar later this week when the sessions are completed. Because of the fast paced nature of our talks today, any questions that are sent in via the question and answer box will be responded to following the sessions several days following the, uh, following the completion of these sessions. As well, please use the question and answer box if you have any troubleshooting issues and our team here will help you get on get back on track. We hope you enjoyed today's topics and remember if you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, please share your experience by uh, using the hashtag Gallagher Talks. I also wanted to mention that, that we have other sessions taking place throughout the day in areas such as construction, fintech, captives, and more. Just follow the link that pops up at the bottom of the screen to take on move on to the next session. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tracy and Jeff to talk about real estate. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you may be at the moment. Uh, thanks for joining us. We uh, Today, we also have on the screen and on our call with our speaker, Jeff Charles. So, Jeff, good morning. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. Good morning, Tracy. It's nice to be here, and hello to everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your day. So, Jeff, you're... Uh, you work in the real estate space in terms of your clients and you've got a lot of experience in it. So most certainly speaking engagement such as this, you're not a stranger to. Uh, there's a lot going on in the space of real estate. So I know you've been asked to do a, a lot of talking about it. So I think we should just jump into this. But I think one of the first things we need to talk about is COVID. Canada is six months into it. Uh, businesses are starting to open up. People are starting to go back to work. And of course, we've got kids going back to so, you know, it's not quite business as usual. We've had to kind of look at how to do things a little bit differently. And um, there's certainly been a very large economic impact on the world and, of course, on, on businesses. So maybe talk to us a little bit about how COVID has actually had an impact or what effects it's had on the commercial real estate segment. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. So I, I think, you know, when we look at <clears throat> when we look at COVID-19, I don't want to um, I don't want to brush over it, but I would I would be uh, remiss if I didn't make the point that I think COVID is actually only accelerating underlying themes and, and issues. You know, I think we started this uh, circumstance with lots of questions around business interruption. Uh, many of those questions, I think, have either been resolved from carrier responses and and looking at the you know the notion of is property damage um, you know triggering cover. Uh, I think there are you know continued exploration of those responses taking place in the courts. Uh, we we specific to real estate ran across vacancy uh, concerns. Um, so you know how do we how do we address and and manage vacancy or occupancy of of real estate? Um, and I think for the most part, the, the insurance community has, has responded to address some of those concerns. And I think what remains with COVID is really now a conversation on return to work place and dealing with the lingering effects. I think that the, you know, the general anxiety, the market is, is, uh, is feeling, uh, not just insurance, but broadly speaking, the economy is feeling, uh, about the impacts of COVID. And I think that insurance hasn't been immune to that. I would suggest for the purposes of our conversation today um, that for those of you who have not seen it, um, check out the, the return to workplace webinar that, that we have produced. Um, I think they did a really solid and candid job uh, building this response to, to, to take measured approach to returning to the workplace. And I think right now in the context of real estate, there's lots of organizations, owners and, and asset managers, property managers, um, you know, working through this in real time. And so there's some resources there. I think, though, Tracy, we're going to spend some time talking about, you know, the actual issues that COVID is, is agitating. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and Jeff, you're right. There's a lot of great information in that uh, webinar link. 
for any type of employer, whether it be real estate or anything else. So if, uh, for people who are looking for more information to get your, your staff back to work safely, feel free to, to get into that. So, so our agenda here, it's, it's a pretty busy agenda. It doesn't look like much. Uh, there's only three items, but there's a lot to talk about in those three items. But just before we uh, get into the, the why and what of what's happening in the marketplace, uh, when you and I had a little prep call yesterday, you said there was just one other subject that maybe doesn't quite fit in this bucket, but that you did want to make sure that you got out to the audience. So I'm just going to let you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tracy. I think this is important. The, the conversation today is going to focus primarily on on the property market, uh, albeit the liability market, the casualty market is having its challenges. But we're going to spend majority of today talking about the impacts of property. And the reason we're going to do that is majority of real estate investment in their insurance program is is allocated, you know, to their property. That's where they're going to feel and see the most impact in their in their overall um, programs. And so. I, you can't really have a, a wholesome discussion about the state of the market uh, talking about real estate and not really touch on these these topics, but we're not going to go uh, into a deep dive. However, uh, there are things happening in the environmental liability space that are really important to understand, uh, particularly as we start to see more assets trade in Canada um, and how the, the environmental issues are being addressed through uh, disposition and acquisition of assets, I think is something that it warrants a second look. Um, terrorism is a is a often misunderstood um, placement. Um, if you if you think about the nature of of the malicious events that we've seen over time, going back to 9/11 and then to, to current date, they've evolved, and a lot of insurance programs have not evolved. Uh, and I think it's important to really understand what terrorism cover is affording you and how it's responding. Uh, be aware that you can tailor these things uh, to suit your organization, depending on the assets you own and, and depending on how you operate your assets. And then the last bit is is really looking at errors and emissions insurance. When you have vertically integrated uh, real estate businesses that are doing all manners of you know construction management, development management, property management, real property asset management, and even fund or financial management asset management. Um, there's exposure created for these businesses through their professional obligations and the contracts that they that they manage all of these uh, offerings under. And we see errors and emissions as one of the most overlooked uh, policies and maybe one of the most important policies in a total insurance program. So um, I think that departing uh, message on these specialty products is don't overlook them. We're going to talk about property today, but if there are questions relating to these lines of business, <clears throat> we encourage you to, to ask about them and we'd love to respond. So we look forward to your questions in the Q&A. Yeah, and, and Jeff, I think that's a great thing, uh, especially with the marketplace the way it is, there's so much focus on getting the core coverages in place going forward that sometimes some of the ancillary coverages aren't necessarily looked at as much as they should be, but certainly very important to the overall program. <laughs> So I think we're just going to kind of jump into this now. We've got a slide up about insurance company performance. I mean, there's no doubt the hard market's a reality. Here, been here for a bit, not going anywhere for a bit. And I think most people on the on the call understand the, the premise of premium dollars collected versus claims dollars paid us. And, you know, they can make that connection between the profitability of the insurance company. But there's just so much more to it. So... Why don't you just take us through it about what's really driving the hard market and maybe touch in on what is a hard market and what exactly is that Yeah, I'm happy, uh, happy to, to walk in this direction, Tracy. So here, here is, I think, what is misunderstood and not necessarily communicated to the consumer of insurance, whether that's homeowner's insurance or right through to sophisticated and complex uh, and, and really complex insurance placements for real estate companies. <laughs> The insurance, uh, the insurance industry is, like many other businesses and, and economies, impacted by interest rates. And you'll appreciate that insurance companies really make money two ways. One is through the float or the investment of the premium that they, they collect, and they earn a return on those investments. And oftentimes, those investments are concentrated in uh, fixed income or, or sovereign debt. Um, and so with sovereign debt yields, globally, and even here in Canada, most recently, uh, you know, as a result of, of COVID, this is why I say it's an accelerator uh, of the underlying issues, a 0% interest rate or very low interest rate environment, and you can see here, we've been in one for coming on 10 years, um, 
a low interest rate environment makes it very challenging for an insurance company to generate profit in a traditional way, which is through their investment return. And as a result of that, it has driven a, a large portion of their focus to their underwriting profit, which is the other way the insurance company makes money. So when they look at their underwriting profitability, if it is not making up for the revenue that they would otherwise earn from their, from their investment portfolio, they're gonna find themselves uh, looking at how they can improve their underwriting profitability. And that's really done in, in a couple of different ways. Um, it's, it's managed by selecting risk and pricing risk. Um, and when you're selecting risk, that part of that process is, is determining how much uh, to bet, uh, so to speak. And so the other challenge the, in, the insurance companies have been facing is that the underwriting profitability has been a problem, particularly when you see uh, images like this or this or this or this being pervasive we are seeing losses outpace the premiums collected and we've been seeing this for for some time and so when we talk about a hard market what we're really talking about is insurance companies trying to drive or return to profitability for their shareholders. And they're going through a process in this particular hard market where they can't rely on investment return. They're going through a process of returning to profitability through underwriting. And that is causing them to revisit every risk and it's causing them to reprice every risk and to reset how they look at every risk they're taking. Jeff, just a quick question for you. When you yeah. show those graphics, and the first three being a hailstorm or a winter storm, water damage, fire. I mean, those are all those are all situations that can happen in any country. But this last one you've got on the screen, I mean, clearly this is a picture of the, that horrific recent explosion in Beirut. So maybe help people understand and draw a line from how an explosion in Beirut affects the Canadian insurance buyer here in terms of pricing or the, or the ability to get that. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks. I'll try and do that pretty quickly. So, it, it, we might ask, what you know, why does an event, uh, why do the California wildfires have an impact on real estate rates? Why does a hurricane in the Gulf Coast have a, an impact on Canadian real estate rates? Why does a Beirut explosion uh, have a have an impact? There's two real impacts. One is reinsurance. The reinsurers are exposed to pools of, of risk across the globe. Uh, and so if the reinsurers start to suffer or, or see losses and they adjust their pricing and appetites, uh, this will have an impact, an underlying impact uh, on all the underlying uh, insurance companies. And then you'll appreciate in Canada specifically, a, a large portion of the insurance companies that operate in Canada are in fact uh, global platforms. And so, um, you know, they look at their entire portfolios on a, on a global basis, not necessarily a region by region basis. So, you know, uh, a company that's performing well in Canada, but performing very poorly elsewhere uh, may look to adjust their performance, uh, not just in the, in the region in which it's, it's performing per, per, uh, poorly, but they may also be looking to benefit from where they are performing well um, and, and take advantage of momentum. So these events, these global uh, catastrophe events uh, uh, are definitely having an impact. And I think you can see it actually, if we look at you know, lost data in Canada. So take the Beirut explosion out of the conversation for a second, and you just look at the three successive years here, you know, you're losing a billion dollars a year to increasing, um, you know, cost of loss on property claims alone in Canada. And, and with 50% of those being water-based, um, where I think, you know, many participants on our, on our uh, talk today will, will have experienced, you know, water damage losses uh, in their real estate portfolios. These aggre the aggregation of these losses are causing mm -hmm. real problems. So you've got low interest rate environment where insurers cannot earn investment return, a returned and renewed focus on underwriting profitability. And that renewed focus is not very pretty. It's just producing losses. This is accelerating the pace at which underwriters need to make a change to, to how they're underwriting. And ultimately that impact is leaking into, you know, the renewals that we're seeing in real estate right now. I think if you, you know, just looking at, at this particular slide, if you actually see you know, some of the uh, the results that the insurers are posting in Canada, 
they're not good. Uh, and, and I don't know if the um, consumer or the, the insurance program buyer has uh, full transparency of just how bad the losses have been. And, and you know, we suffered a hail loss in Alberta earlier in the summer. It was the fourth largest uh, cat event in the, in the country in our history of, of insurance response. And it didn't really make the news, uh, certainly not the business news. And so I think the, the, the awareness here is that the insurance companies are not performing. That is why there is a, a push here to to return to performance. So I've got two questions there, Jeff. One is um, one is how do you explain? Because you you must hear this every day from clients. How do you explain to a client when they say to you, "Hey, Jeff, I haven't hey, had Jeff, I haven't had I haven't had any losses. Yeah. So why is my premium going up so much? Like why do I care about all this? I've had zero losses for ten years. I've had no losses. Why do I have to?" increase in premium. So how do you kind of go about answering that? So that's the first first part of it. And then the second part yeah, is I mean, go ahead. No, so the first so the first part of that is um I sympathize with that uh I sympathize with that message. I think for those that are working with really good and clean loss histories, uh it might be the most painful uh, moments for, for those market participants. Um, the reality is there are things that can be done, and I think we're going to address them on the you know the tail end of this conversation. There are things that can be done to mitigate the impacts of a hardening market when insurers are moving price, moving capacity, or moving terms and conditions. There are things that can be done to stave off some of those impacts. Some of them are technical. Uh, some of those things are, are driven out of relationship. Um, and And I think the the best thing that can be done there is around presenting the story and making that case. Uh, if that case isn't being made well about the fact that there are no losses over the last 10 years, that needs to be really highlighted and, and managed. It, it can't simply be a document that gets sent to an, sent to an insurer for them to interpret. It, it needs to be brought to the forefront and, and discussed. Yeah. You, there was a second part, though, Tracy. The second part is, I mean, you, you look at this graph, there's some pretty high double-digit numbers even higher triple digit numbers. So clearly this isn't sustainable. I mean, insurance carriers can't keep posting these types of results and expect to, to return to profitability. So let, let's give some ideas of what the insurers are doing to try to, to reverse this trend, to try to get these numbers yeah, so Tracy, I think this is this is really important for everybody to understand in the marketplace. If if everyone understands how the marketplace is working, uh, then the opportunity to man, to maneuver within it uh, be, becomes more available. But I think the first issue is too many people aren't aware of what the actual underlying uh, what the underlying nuances are. So I'm going to go back to very basics in a in a graph um, that would typically be shown in a, in an economics 101. Uh, in a 101 class to, to use it as a reminder of, you know, what we're seeing and where the acceleration is coming from. You have a classic supply demand issue starting to form. So if you go back to the actual issue, underwriters are losing money from losses and they are not making money from the area in which they would make money typically in their investments. They need to stop the losses. So, how do you stop the losses? You change the way that you that you underwrite, and you change the way that you view uh, the risks, uh, which might mean we're we're taking a more detailed and thorough look at the business, and we want to understand more about the underlying assets. We want to see engineering. We want to understand operating philosophies. We want to see your pipeline of acquisition. We want a deeper view and a closer seat at the table to how your operations working. Give me a better feeling of what that loss uh, expectancy is going to look like. The other thing that they're doing is is then making decisions about how much do we put up. So if they bet one hundred dollars last year, uh, they might bet fifty dollars this year because they want to reduce the impact of the loss. So we are seeing a supply decrease, and you can see this in the S one to S two line in our chart. You're seeing them reduce the amount of supply that they're putting forward in certain circumstances, and that could be done, you know, specifically with the amount of insurance that they're willing to put up in their capacity, or it could be done through terms and conditions, or it could be done with adjustment or change to deductible. But all of those things, I would, I would argue, represent a change in the, in the appetite to the negative or a reduction of their participation. And when you have less participation uh, from a marketplace, you typically get a rising price. 
what's accelerating this is once you find out who will participate and the numbers get to be, you know, there's a fewer number of people willing to participate, that can actually accelerate price. So if you can imagine that S2 line moving almost this way to uh, even fewer and fewer and fewer, you can actually see that price line starting to move up. And we're caught right in the middle of that. I think what um, I think what's important to look at is that, um, you know, here's a picture of large property rates, uh, North American large property rates as of, uh, you know, January 1, 2020. So we haven't even seen the impacts of COVID in this chart, uh, you know, where you would bring in a heightened anxiety of, well, I don't, I'm not even really sure. I'm trying to change my underwriting philosophies and we're trying to revisit how we're underwriting these books. And now there's COVID on top of this. I'm not really sure. I think that this line, this property rate line has continued through 2020 even more sharply than, than represented here. But I think uh, it's important to recognize that the reason the rates are moving is because there's su less supply in the market. There's less appetite for the same things that there were last year or the year before or the year before. Does that, so, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, yeah, it, it does make sense. So, so that gets from you, Jeff, in terms of where we are with the economic impact of the pandemic and the fact that the hard market was already here for a bunch of different reasons which we've gone through. Best guess, where do you see at this hard market going? Is it going to continue on this for some time, one year, two years? And, and I know it's just a guess, but you have a lot of but yeah, it was a nice, it's a curveball, Tracy. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I think the we'll try, but that's what we do, right? We try and hit. This is what the market's doing. We're trying to hit curveball. So I think the in 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 my very humble and limited opinion, uh, it's this is something that's going to continue well into next year. I think the interest rate environment has has had a real impact here, and so long as that the globe. Uh, continues to operate in a low interest rate environment and and in Canada specifically in a low interest rate environment, um, you know, this is going to continue to be a per pervasive issue until we can demonstrate a year or two of profitability for the insurance companies. Imagine not making a profit for an extended period of time. Uh, you know, in some of those uh, figures we saw, it's like two and three years, four years of not being profitable. Uh, shareholders want to see return, and and so the pressure to to drive profitability is not is not going to go away. Uh, I do think, however, there may be the arrival of new capital. Um, you know, these are circumstances where you know relief capital can arrive, whether that's in the form of reinsurance or the introduction of you know the insurance linked securities or or greater adoption of things like cat bonds and captives, which, you know, our group is going to be talking to specifically later today. Um, the arrival of that relief capital or non-traditional capital to to soften some of this, put more supply back into the into the marketplace um, is, a, is an outcome. So I think the um, I think it's here certainly for the next 12 months. Uh, renewals between now and March of 2021 are going to continue at the same sort of intensive rate pace uh, that we've seen, or at least at the rates that have kind of been set by the market. And you'll also appreciate, I think there's a lot of January 1 reinsurance renewals that people will be keeping an eye on. Uh, you know, typically the, the Monte Carlo convention for the reinsurers would be taking place and, and uh, you know, I think there's lots of discussion around what's going to happen with some of those uh, some of those renewals. I, my my best guess is is that we're in this for at least another year um, of sort of tense uh, capacity restricted underwriting uh, until we until we see some relief. Okay, so so thanks for that. And thanks for answering, considering I just kind of threw that at you. So we we talked a lot about what's going on and why it's going on. So I think we yeah. need to get into how. So. For clients out there, you know, this has been a, a bit of doom and gloom. This is what they're feeling. So how do we help them? And maybe more specifically, what does Gallagher bring to help them? But how do we help them get through this? How do we help them make sure they've got the coverage they need, that it's available at a, at a price that is relatively affordable in this type of marketplace? So, you know, talk to us about the capacity challenges in the marketplace and what we can do to help those. Yeah, so Tracy, thanks. I think the... A uh, critical element here, and this is for everybody watching today, listening today, 
um, who who's responsible for buying insurance for your for your organization, uh, particularly that in the real estate space. It's been for the last ten years really easy to underwrite real estate. Uh, you haven't needed engineering. Uh, you could put forward a big, large statement of values, uh, and you would uh, play the markets off each other to drive price down. And that that game is gone. Um, I think what's really important now is information, and there's a real competitive adva- advantage we found with our within our own teams at Gallagher. Uh, I'm going to talk really quickly about three things. One is the 360. This is an internalized philosophy that looks at the total cost of risk from six different angles uh, in a in a in a business, and I think that this process uh, of taking our, our clients through an evaluation of where their risk actually lies allows them to make decisions about their investment in insurance uh, and where that investment is, whether that's in resource list loss control or, or mitigation, talking about uninsured uh, exposures and, and how to address those things. This process is really important because it resets the conversation internally um, you know, with our, with our client base or with the buyer to say, okay, wh- why are we buying this again? How are we buying this? What are the exposures? Where are the obligations? That conversation should be reset, and we should have a, a blank slate. Let's get back to the basics of what we're doing here and why. And then to supplement that exercise, we look at two internal proprietary information sources. One is Gallagher Drive, an internal benchmarking, real live benchmarking platform that allows us to see by market segment, by geography, by um, property uh, liability or product line, what's happening uh, you know, in a trailing 12 month, on a trailing 24 month, we've got really good data about where the market is uh, from the volume of business that, that we uh, happen to act on behalf of in Canada. And then you know, conversely, we have Gallagher Forecast, which is allowing us to visually represent our clients' assets in front of hazards. Uh, and it's really, really beneficial to the underwriting process. It eliminates a lot of friction. Here's just a, a quick preview of Gallagher Forecast, where we're, you know, mapping client assets in the face of hazards. So the conversation uh, that follows with an underwriter is not one of is this catastrophically exposed. It is no, this is catastrophically exposed to this extent, or no, it's not catastrophically exposed. Um, and this is very beneficial to clients. They have a better view all of a sudden of where their assets lay against physical hazards and catastrophic exposure, but also really important for the conversations that, that are taking place with the underwriters. And, and I think that's a good point. You have more collaboration in this environment between the client, the broker, and the underwriter to kind of get everybody on the same team. So, uh, Jeff, what's your advice to a client, most especially ones with the multi million dollar property schedules or even billion dollar property schedules? They really are facing a renewal smack dab in the middle of a capacity crunch. So what's your advice to them? Yeah, so um, the advice here is, is first of all, uh, I mean, there's, there's a bit of advice. It's, first of all, get comfortable with what's going on in the marketplace. Make sure that you understand, you know, the capital markets events that are, that are taking place so that we understand how the flow of capital is moving and kind of try and, be, try and get a sense of the pulse of where, where are we at in the market. And then beyond that, making sure that your information is prepared, organized, cleanly and and beautifully uh, organized and and presentable to an underwriter. You want to imagine that you're delivering something beautiful that they're going to put on their desk, keep on the top of their desk and really want to be attracted to. This is a a sales conversation. We are selling the business risks uh, to to those that, that are willing to take it on. And so you know, once we get through, and we would call that the basics, right? We need to get through those basics and really return to the basics and do it really, really, really well. When we get that part of the the, the story uh, organized, I think then the advice we have is work with the market, match match the actual capacity of the market to your program and try to understand how what the market is delivering or needing to do in order to return to their profitability, how that exercise fits with the actual exposure and risk in your own business to potentially redesign your structure. And I've, we've got three little images here that I think help tell a bit of a story. But if you're sitting in, if you're sitting with a, a portfolio where you've got half a billion dollars of real estate uh, and you know you don't have any one asset that's more than 150 million dollars, you know are you buying too much insurance? Uh, is one question. Uh, are you buying that insurance effectively is another question. And who are you buying it from is a, is a third question. If you're buying all of it from one group, uh, potentially too much, 
and in you know one straight line, uh, this is going to be a problem because if insurer A is stumbling or needs to get to profitability, you could be you know exposed in a way that's not healthy for your business. Uh, and and definitely not healthy for the underwriter. So how do you match that? If you understand what the underwriter's capacity is, appetite is, you might look at something like the third um, the third box, where you actually take a look at well, in a five hundred million dollar portfolio, we think the actual largest exposure is one hundred and fifty million dollars, and we think that scenario is a you know a, a, a fire that takes out a, a couple of stories in an office tower, for example. Uh, but let's buy the insurance to the exposure. And for everybody else whose appetite has changed, who's no longer interested in being that close to a fire, uh, pardon that that uh, pun, but if they don't want to be that close to the fire, well, then maybe we can work with them to put their capacity out up here. And and so I think that the advice is look at your profile, your profile of your portfolio, understand your your data and make sure that you can articulate to underwriters the exposures in your portfolio that are of most concern. Ask the insurers for insurance that matches what they're trying to accomplish in their exercises and really bring the, bring the story together to make sure that you end up with a, a program structure that's efficient for you and efficient for the market. We would argue that this is gonna cause the best long-term result uh, for everybody uh, over time. Yeah, and, and I think that's really important, yeah. sustainability of the program as opposed over the long term, not just not just for the next 12 months. So, so we're getting to the end, uh, Jeff, but before we go, I mean, you've given us a, a ton of insight into what's really behind the curtain and what's going on in the hard market besides just the losses. So appreciate that. But I want to make sure I give you the opportunity that if there was one key ingredient for a recipe for a more successful and you know, uh, experience for the client in going through a renewal in this hard market, what exactly from your experience would that be? What's your key ingredient? Yeah, um, I think this statement says it, says it all for me, Tracy. Uh, communication is critical. I've heard uh, from too many individuals in our, in our marketplace, from buyers, that they're not finding out about their insurance results until literally days, yeah. not weeks, not not months, days before they renew. And what's so troublesome about that is that what's being overlooked is the communication to the stakeholders. Do the lenders know? Do the boards know? You know, if you're running an asset manager and you've got, you know, investment equity capital that you need to be communicating with, are they aware? How can you how can you reasonably, you know, operate your business and stand out as best in class if you're not learning the details of your renewal, you know, uh, in a matter of days prior to the actual dates? That is a huge problem. Um, and I think when you think about the statement communication is critical, let's talk and unpack communication. You got to think about your stakeholder communication. You need to communicate with you know, your, your property level individuals to explain what's going on with liability and why that, you know, why are our rates uh, up and why is our loss ratio? What, how's that performing? You need, we need to think about how that communication is being managed. We need to communicate to the lenders about potential deductible changes. We need to communicate to, uh, to investors and boards about the impacts of these costs. And so I also think communicating with underwriters is the battle here. Um, making sure that underwriters understand the business and the assets that are there, all the things that you've seen, these graphics, these uh, articulations of you know how to design the insurance program, this is all communication. And so I think it needs to start earlier. I think it needs to you know involve more people than it typically has. I really think you know we should be thinking about buying insurance the same way we think about raising debt or raising equity we really need to change the way that we communicate about the underlying risks and only then are we going to get to better results uh, in the marketplace and i would also argue the underwriters uh, could participate in this process in a more effective way in their communication too so many people can get comfortable and wrap their heads around the economic impacts and the figures the results the actual market results uh, but if it's not communicated effectively, that's what's really bothering people and causing and causing most of the anxiety and the stress that we're feeling is that the communication is is broken. And so I would argue that the the best the best bit of advice is start a conversation uh, as quickly as you can. Yeah. 
and and I mean, you're, you're bang on there, right? There's nothing is successful without good communication, whether it be a business relationship, a personal relationship, or otherwise. So, so Jeff, I want to thank you very much for uh, providing the information you did, uh, taking the time today. I hope uh, everybody on the call took a little bit away from this, something they didn't know before. And, um, you know, thanks again, and I hope everybody has a really great day.